Um, I'm uh, Professor John Simons, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at Macquarie University. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this event tonight. But before I say any more, I'll ask my friend, uh, Uncle Lex Odiostad, to perform the Welcome to Country. Lex. Thank you, John. Warami Nalawa. It's greetings in the local language here, the Darug language. My name is Lex Dad. I'm a traditional Aboriginal man from here from Sydney. My people were first contacted by the English. I have Irish ancestry and Aboriginal ancestry. I can see some people look at me and they go, he's not a black fella, he's a white fella. And I go, shh, don't tell anyone, I'm undercover. All right. <laughs> first off, we're on the land of the Wadamadigal, part of the Darug Nation. And I'm actually a Ganamagal man from the Prospect area, also part of the Darug Nation. I'd like to pay respects to my elders, both past and present. I pay respects to Biari, the Sky Father, and Wiari, Mother Earth. And big respects to Mother Earth because she gives us everything that we use on a daily basis. And I'd also like to pay respects to all of you, and I see many new faces here. I'd like to pay respects to my elders, both past and present, and my future elders, the children. Now, tonight I wasn't going to explain a welcome to country, but I think I will because I see many new faces. In Australia, we have over 300 different countries and over 300 different languages, Aboriginal countries and Aboriginal languages. Boundaries are respected. You didn't have the right just to walk onto someone else's country uninvited. We don't have a history of fighting over land and warring over country. Traditionally, I'm on my country now and in the Blue Mountains where I live, I'm on the borders of my country. If I wanted to go over into Lithgow, that is Wiradjuri country. Traditionally, if I wanted to go in there, I would sit on their borders and I would light a fire. I would send up special smoke and wait to be approached by a traditional custodian. They would come and ask me my business. I could be there to share important news or to travel through country to gather more stories for my people because all our rock sites and our rock engravings are all connected right up throughout Australia like a big spider web. Now, they would tell me the rules of that country where I was allowed to go and where I wasn't allowed to go, because there's sacred men's sites and sacred women's sites. Today, I can't tell you the rules of my country. I can tell you the rules, but I can't insist on them since colonisation. But I can ask you very humbly to respect one another, to look after one another, because it's only been 228 years in Australia as a whole since we've had poor people, since we've had homeless people, since we've had orphans, jails, and nursing homes. Before then, we didn't have any such thing. We had strict sharing laws. We had to look after one another. Everyone had a right to food and housing. Now, I'd like to also congratulate Joseph Vissel on what a beautiful exhibition and beautiful photography that all tells a story just like our people and where we've been. Before we finish on the welcome, I would just like to sing you a song and this song is from Uncle Gabu Ted Thomas. I pay respects to him. And I pay respects to Uncle Lockie Dennis for transposing into his language. This song is of the dreaming, it's of peace, it's of love, and it's of standing strong. And where we can all come together and have a better future. Burgo, Burgo. We are, we are Gadawan. Burgo, Burgo, Burgo. Narabagali, Mirabu, Gaga. Gabaganal, Gabaganal, Gabaganal. We are, we are Gadawan. Gabaganal, Gabaganal, Gabaganal. Narabagali, Mirabu, Gaga. Winning guy, winning guy, winning guy. We are, we are Gadawan. Winning guy, winning guy, winning guy. Na 
Narabagali Mirabu Gaga Wanga 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 We are we are Gada Wanga 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 Narabagali Mirabu Gaga Narabagali Mirabu Gaga Yanana Bujari Gumara, please walk with good spirit. Warame Mindika Darag Nyura, welcome friends to Darag country. Tijiri Go and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Lex. Um, it now gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Alan Davis, the Emeritus Curator of Photography of the State Library of New South Wales, uh, officially to open this exhibition. Thanks, Deputy Vice-Chancellor. What a fabulous gallery and what a great show. Congratulations to those involved. Now, photography is one of the great 19th century inventions. It ranks up there with railways, electricity, and even the flushing toilet. But unlike those other great inventions, photography achieved a remarkable immediate acceptance in the community. People are hesitant of new technology, and I don't blame them. You know, when William James ran the first railway across Britain, his workers were stoned by people not wanting those iron rails in their backyard. Fair enough. Young Michael Faraday demonstrated his prototype electric motor, an electromagnetic rotative device, at the Royal Society. He was politely applauded, and then someone commented, that was very nice, Mr Faraday, but what possible use is it? <laughs> but I guess the greatest indignity of all was that which befell poor old Thomas Crapper. I have to em everyone laughs. I don't know why. I have to say, Thomas Crapper did not invent the flushing toilet, but he sure as hell perfected it. He used to have 70 gallon tanks of water to test out his bowl shapes and sizes and S bends and so on. And the testing material was green apples and air vesicles, which were basically folded pieces of paper containing air. And one amazing flush, he got rid of seven green apples three air vesicles and two pieces of paper stuck to the side of the bowl with plumber's grease. Now, that's never been exceeded. I mean, it makes you wonder about Victorian meals, but the problem is Thomas Crapper's name has gone into the English language without any of that sort of elegance of, say, an Earl of Sandwich or a Davenport or a Chesterfield. Yes, Crap was around before Crapper, but he sort of cemented his position there. Now, Photography wasn't like that. It was incredible. It was announced in the French Parliament by Arago, the scientist, on behalf of Louis Daguerre, the inventor. It was in 1839. And on the 19th of August that year, it was released to the public. Within one hour, all the optician shops in Paris were besieged by people wanting this miraculous apparatus. Within two years, photography had reached every continent on Earth. And the first photograph in Australia was taken on, on um, the 13th of May 1841. It was a view of Bridge Street and part of George Street from the fountain in Macquarie Place. The photographer was on one Augustin Lucas, who was a visiting French naval captain. Today, of course, we take something like five billion photographs annually. Now, we're not sure the exact number. In the days when we could count film, back in the 1990s, it was very easy. The Photo Marketing Association used to actually count the rolls of film that went through processing labs. And we know the answer then was 1.2 billion, rising at 5% um, percent annually. With the invention of the digital camera, of course, the number exploded. Um, in truth, most photographs today are taken on mobile phones and other electronic devices. And anyone who's been to a wedding recently will be amused by the strange sight of people holding up iPads everywhere. <laughs> Strangely even, there are now seven million more mobile phones in Australia than there are men, women and children. 
I'm reminded of all this by something that I observed in my suburb two weeks ago. I live in Lewisham, an inner west suburb of Sydney. Demographic changes have meant that it's no longer a fragmentation zone or migrant groups, but it's trendy. And we have a subculture called hipsters. <laughs> now, one local cafe in Petersham, the industrial guns decorated grumpy barista, actually sells cronuts. Now, cronuts are like a donut without a hole. And <laughs> It comes complete with a syringe so that you can inject Nutella into your cronut. Um, seriously, I mean a hypodermic syringe comes to the table. <laughs> anyway, I was sitting with my wife in an another cafe nearby, the former Portuguese cafe Sweet Bellum. They make the best Portuguese tarts in Sydney, by the way. When a young, trendy Asian couple arrived. She was immaculate and obviously not a, a true hipster. With, as my wife pointed out, Prada shoes, um, some horrendously overpriced handbag. Oh, I can't remember the brand, but I know my wife was in awe. And a Fendi scarf. Now, our companion was somewhat less elegant. He had the regulation number of tears in his jeans, but um, he just sat down outside, lit up a cigarette and got her to go inside to get coffee and cake, which, to my amazement, she did. By the time she'd reappeared, he'd disappeared down the road to have a fag. Now, Amazingly, she wasn't phased. She stayed at the table, pulled out her iPhone 6, the big one, and proceeded to photograph herself and her costume. <laughs> Tilting her head coquettishly from side to side, smiling like Mona Lisa, and she cranked off about 30 to 40 frames in 10 minutes. I was amazed. The companion reappeared, sat down, threw down the coffee, ate the cake, and then pulled out his phone and proceeded to sort of play a game on it because I could see that they were cartoon characters. They never said a word. And when they got up and left, my wife and I were just sit sitting there stunned, feeling, we're very old. <laughs> As the young lady demonstrated, though, most photographs taken today are personal mementos. There are very little significance. And a photo historian like myself isn't that interested. Photographs, though, with captions are great visual documents. And of course, in the library, we have something like one and a half million photographs showing Australians everything from the oldest known photograph through to photographs made in the last few weeks. Now, I retired last year after 25 years. I'm now emeritus curator. It doesn't come with a, a remuneration, though, unfortunately. <laughs> the good thing, though, is I'm no longer part of that endless stream of people going, trudging to work every morning and coming home um, each day, so eloquently described by Henry Lawson in his poem, Faces in the Street. By the way, he wrote that poem in 1888 in Petersham, the very suburb I've just described here with hipsters, how things have changed. On my infrequent trips into the city these days, I'm now an observer, and it's remarkable to see all the things that I never noticed before. That's where photographers can be so important. They show us things we hadn't even registered in the sensory overload of our everyday lives. We are surrounded by images and rarely have time to look. Everyone now has the means of taking photographs, and while I applaud the democratisation of photography, there's one problem. It seems that everyone thinks they're a photographer. <laughs> yes, today's digital cameras and mobile devices means that perfect photographs can be taken by anybody, correctly exposed and perfectly focused. But to do it consistently is another matter entirely. Even old photographers like myself love those automatic white balance on modern cameras. But just pressing the shutter until you get a good shot isn't good enough. As Joe can testify, in the days of film, it used to be quite difficult to make a good photograph. These days, it's really easy to make a bad photograph. <laughs> Unfortunately, most people don't seem to know what constitutes a great photograph. You only have to look at the vast archive of Flickr to realise that photography has fallen victim to the lowest common denominator, with effusive praise given for, at best, mediocre shots. Awesome pick, is the usual comment underneath. <laughs> Perhaps I'm getting old and grumpy. 
But the most popular photograph from, at the library on Flickr, we had to get onto these sort of modern media, um, is a black and white photograph of some molting penguins shivering on the ice taken by Frank Hurley during the Australasian Antarctic Expedition of 1911 to 1914. It's captioned that way, by the way, 1911 to 1914. OK, it's very cute, but the several hundred comments from the public are worrying. Cool pic, seems to be the main comment. <laughs> Frankie babe, what was your exposure? <laughs> Expecting a comment back from someone who died in 1962. <laughs> I did love the appreciation of one new fan though. Frank, you should be better known. But I guess the worst, and keeping in mind he hur Hurley used black and white glass plate negatives, was a plaintiff, do penguins have any colour? <laughs> it's important to realise that Frank Hurley did not have a fancy digital camera with more menus than you can ever use. I should also tell you that Frank Hurley is Joe Vissel's favourite photographer. I think they both share the same ability to get a great image, no matter the circumstance. Despite what the camera magazines tell you, the reality is equipment, equipment doesn't matter that much. Great photographs are made in the head. Anyway, my advice to any young photographers here is think before you press the shutter and look at lots of great books of great photographers and go to good galleries like this and where you'll see what photographs should and you know, can look like. Now, I don't have to give Joe any advice. He's been photographing for 50 years. He knows precisely what he's doing. And this retrospective is an astonishing um, array and variety of images. I've known Joe for a quarter of a century. But when I was researching the history of colour photography in 2003, I realised I'd actually known of him much longer. When I was a keen young photographer myself in the mid-60s, I was avidly reading photo magazines and I remember photographs by a young staff photographer testing the first rolls of colour negative film in Sydney. You've probably forgotten. There was a snap of the photographer in the alleyways of the city looking very trendy. <laughs> I checked and yes, it was a young Joe Vissel. Now Joe's been a commercial and professional um, an advertising photographer for over 50 years. He was born in the Netherlands in 1935. He trained after the war in the Amsterdam studio of Jan Schriet. <laughs> it looks like shite. But, <laughs> but you know, Napoleon actually said of the Dutch language, it's not so much a language as a throat affliction. <laughs> and he worked in England for two years before migrating to Australia in 1960. He worked as commercial phot photographer at Doug Baglin's studio, the great Doug Baglin, and then for six years as a stills photographer at the Artransa Park studios in uh, French's Forest. In 68, he struck out on his own at Pat Purcell's old studio in Elizabeth Street, working for leading companies and advertising agencies. He freelanced for the Australian Tourist Commission, and we actually have a lot of photographs by Joe uh, in the library from that source. The Freelance Photographers Guild of uh, New York and the Photo Library of Australia in North Sydney. As rents went up, he briefly shared a studio with uh, the great Robert McFarland at Robert Walker's studio in Surrey Hills. He joined Macquarie University as a photographer in 1974, recording university events, student life and personalities for the next 20 years before retirement. That didn't stop him, of course. And you'll see some of the photographs that kept him busy up to this century on the walls here tonight. The first time I actually met Joe was after a colleague curated an exhibitioner at the Opera House and used his portrait of Woodson, taken from a magazine. Joe rang up a little upset at the use of his image without permission or acknowledgement. It was in the early days of my career, so I went into full damage control, apologising profusely. Now, as a measure of the man, it turned out that it wasn't that it was used without permission that upset him. It was just that it was such a crappy copy from a <laughs> half-tone magazine. He actually gave the library a decent copy directly from the negative so that at least his work looked good in the future. <laughs> of course, I couldn't help but love him after that. And I'm pleased to say the library eventually bought um, much of Joe's photography, including 848 prints, 
1,386 transparencies. That's a tiny fraction of his output. You understand most professional photographers, they work for clients and they don't keep things. Now, at least future generations will get to know Joe's talent. Now, his portrait of Jorn Utzen up the back there, which I'm sure you've all seen, is a masterpiece and a demonstration of Joe's ability to improvise and his ability to commit someone like Jorn Utzen to put a bag over his head while he photographs his hands. Now, whatever you do, listen to Joe's description of the event um, on the screen behind us here when it's put back on and you'll see how hilarious the episode was. Now, there's a wonderful portrait of the a Dutch composer Hans Creek in 1952, right at the end of the corner there. Now he used little tiny table lamps, look he's only 17, he's using little table lamps to light this great man's face. And in Joe's hands it looks like some amazing Hollywood lighting, the George Hurrell style of lighting. Just have a careful look at that picture and realise he was 17 when he did that. It's an indication of his early talent. Now, Joe clearly understood the rules of photography or portraiture. And so it was a big shock to me to realise 10 years later, he was taking an extraordinary image of John Bell over here, near where the camera is. It's, it's bizarre. It's an extraordinary one-eye image of the actor, wide-angled, distorted and quite disturbing. It's nonetheless memorable. It's a great image. Now, Joe could handle anything. Portraits, landscapes, advertising, um, documentary, wedding, film and television stills, architecture and even aerial. I love Joe's observation about aerial photography. It's not that difficult. You put the lens on infinity, sticky tape it down so it doesn't move. <laughs> I, also, I also love Joe's favourite saying about photography in which he quotes Max de Payne who said, a great photographer should concentrate more on depth of feeling than depth of focus. <laughs> Joe, I love this retrospective and I commend your photography. As you know, your photograph of Woodson hangs on the walls of my house, along with other greats of Australian photography. I can offer no greater praise than saying I see your photograph every day and smile, knowing who took it and how it was made. I count you as a friend. And I'm happy to open Moments in Time. Thank you. Well, good now. Take it like that. Thank you very much for your talk. Oh, oh no, it's for you. Probably handsome. It now gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce the gentleman whose awesome picks around us, uh, Joseph Vissel. Well, lucky me, I was told I've got three minutes to talk. So I can't say, oops, I can't say too much. <clears throat> My main thing is to thank people. I really am very, very grateful for the help I've had of many, many people. Uh, oh, incidentally, one other thing is I started at Macquarie Uni in the photography department in 1974, and I was here for 20 years, and I've been retired for 20 years. That's how the times are moving. Anyway, I just really want to just say, I want to thank Rhonda, particularly, as you can hear me, for sort of having me here. Rhonda's in charge of all this. Effie and Leonard, they are, Effie particularly, has all this work has, has done it all. She cut it out and put all these pictures together and she's done a terrific job. I worked with Effie for a long time and we got on always very well. Well, most of the time. <laughs> uh, Dolly and Sheik is here. Dolly is from Vision Graphic and they did all these, all the color prints and even black and white prints have been done by Dolly. And I just talked with Effie before about that. Black and a color was not anywhere near as archival as black and white, but I'm told that now nowadays, uh, Kodak, both Kodak and Fiji have acknowledged it, that uh, color paper uh, prints are now archival too, which means that it lasts something like a hundred years at least. 
So, which is wonderful. In, in the old days, certainly of old films of mine, they just all rotted, old prints. So anyway, Dolly did all these wonderful prints and he said, put up with a lot for me. Can you do a bit darker, a bit lighter, a bit sharper? And Dolly has a lot of patience for vision graphics in, in St. Leonard's. Simon Creedy, I think, is not here. Simon occasionally, I asked him to do a little retouching. He was on the computer and I haven't got the faintest idea of it all. And uh, one of them that he did is that one there with the trumpet player. That's the one digitally manipulated picture. Just very quickly, uh, we were in South Australia and there was a Humpapa procession going through the streets. And I took a picture of this fellow with his Humpapa, with his uh, uh, instrument uh, in the rain and just took him fairly close up. And I didn't think about it anymore till much later. I did a little print here in color print of it in uni. And then I sort of, after a while, I thought, gee, this is not a bad print. And so I went to then my friend around the corner, uh, uh, Simon Creed, who was the designer, and very clever log. So I went, Simon, can you just do this, to add a, make it a little sharper? Can you do a, put a bit more yellow in it? Put a bit of red in it, a bit more red, a bit more yellow, anyway, so that's then finally the result there. Chong Eng, I want to give a special thank, thank you to my old boss here at Macquarie Uni. We still get together even now, some of us, and, and monthly, which is rather lovely. And Chong Eng has been and just wonderful to me. Uh, I had the time problem because I was a cheeky bloke and I didn't always get on with anybody, I think. But anyway, he was fantastic. My friend John Early is here. When we came to Australia, we got a, a flat in St. Leonard's and I walked up the road and there was a photographer there. And uh, can you... Um, you got a job? Oh yeah, mate, start tomorrow. Oh no, 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 not tomorrow. Well, Monday then. Oh, all right. And that was Douglas Baglin. And that's where I met John, and we've been friends ever since. So that's some 60 years, I think. And we often went out on barbecues. John invited us to the first barbecue. And last but not least, uh, Odin, I don't think I thanked my family, did I, in the beginning? Uh, my family have been very, very patient with me. It was always photography first. We go on trips, uh, old Joe, stop the car, and I run out and take a picture, and they just sat waiting there. Anyway, and finally, I just uh, have it all, I think, here. The Deputy VC, uh, Professor Simons. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'd better meet, too. I, I had a feeling it was you, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Alan Davis, like Alan said it all for me, Alan is just wonderful. Uh, interestingly, after my Utsun picture, Ellen was the first one to acknowledge it. Effie actually started pushing me around a bit with it. She said, you've got to do something with that. You've got to do something with it. I'd lay idle for about 30 years till, I did, till I, what Ellen said, till I met the, uh, saw that bad picture in, in an exhibition that I realized a bit more. And then I went to see Ellen and I said, Ellen, I've got this picture. I rang him. I've got this picture of Utsun. Are you interested at all? So I said, come over and Ellen straight away and he offered me some money and I can't remember, I don't think that was my intention. Um, but that, and so Ellen has been particularly uh, wonderful. And then I got to know her now and then we had a cup of coffee or so together and then one day as I started sort of looking at my photography and got it all together and I sort of, I thought, gee, this is actually quite good work. I went, I rang Ellen again. I said, Ellen, or I met her maybe, and I said, Ellen, I've got some stuff in the library, be interested in it. I said, yeah, I said, it's okay. So we had the, the dining room and the living room, and the whole room, was, I laid it all over the place, articles and photos. Ellen came in and said, I take the lot. <laughs> so anyway, that's... My that's was very happy. <laughs> uh, actually, I, that is a, I must say, my, my, I think my one and only check I ever received, and it was very good, I must say, it was very... In the library, I, I really appreciated that. I needed it at the time, particularly. Anyway, that's about all for now. I think. Uh, thank you. I sort of. I have to make it very short. I was told. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's just unbelievable. It looks like the, I, I, one day I, I got uh, rang Effie or and, and Leonard. I said, I think the whole of Sydney is coming. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much for coming. I,
Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much, Joseph. Um, just a few thanks uh, from me uh, to Effie Alexakis, the chief curator of this show, to the Art Gallery curatorial staff, to Ian Brew, Rocket Matler, Tim Moore, the events and marketing teams, and also to Lester Bunnell from Paper Monkey Designs. And thank you, everyone, for coming.